Hey everybody. Alright. Now that we've done this three other times, this should go really, really well. Uh, so, what's a DAG? Uh, I'm sure that you've probably heard at this point people throw this term around a little bit. Um, DAG is just a, a fancy acronym for directed acrylic graph, which is a very fancy word for a really simple concept. Um, if you think about a normal tree structure, you have a root and then some branches and then eventually some leaves. And typically in a tree structure, a leaf would have one parent. Um, in a DAG, it's a tree, but a leaf could have multiple parents. Um, you can't have circular references. We'll get into that in a minute. And that's impossible, but um, that's all that it means. It's unnecessary uh, <coughs> gobbledygook. Uh, <laughs> so let's build a DAG. Um, so one interesting thing about building uh, hash-based data structures is that you have to build them backwards. Um, so get used to writing recursive functions. <laughs> I hope you enjoy that. Um, so we're going to start here with hello world, just our little object, which is the leaf node. Um, we're going to get a hash of that. The hash is QM hash one. Now we build the first branch to that leaf node. Um, that's going to, you know, be an object with a property of foo that points at this leaf node. That's going to get QM hash two. And then we can create another leaf node, all pointing back into a parent. Um, so this one has a bar property that points to the same leaf node, and another property that's just some arbitrary metadata. Um, and both of those are referred to in the root, so they both get hashed and then use as properties in the root node. So what you end up with is a full data structure that looks something like this, right? Um, now, in, in this one, you can't tell that these are basically pointing the same thing, but semantically, this is a big data structure that you get. And then you can break that into blocks like this. Now, obviously, this is a very tiny data structure, so we wouldn't normally break this into a bunch of blocks, but when you have really arbitrarily large data structures and you want to break them into smaller semantic blocks, this is how you do it. You do it with linking. Um, and the way that links uh, end up working in any API, in IPLD, or in IPFS, is that they get, they get uh, traversed basically transparently. So you know, if you take the, the hash of QM4, which, which is our root node here, um, and you follow it through, you know, one through hello, you traverse through the entire structure until you hit this, this hello thing, right? And it's just going to grab all of those blocks for you and traverse it um, transparently. Um, but you could also, you know, grab the, the hash of one of the leaf nodes here, like QM hash three, and look at a property there. Um, you could grab the hash of the leaf node itself and look at a property, right? So, um, you know, if you already have the hash of, of any of these uh, branches, you can traverse it even more efficiently. Um, here we go. So, if we look at the tree now, sort of in a top-down way, where the links are sort of pointing down, um, we can talk about some of the, the nice constraints of, of making DAGs. So, we see here that we have um, two branches pointing to the same leaf, but what happens if we try to create a reference back to the parent. We basically try to create a circular reference. Well, it's actually impossible <laughs> because if you modify this, you're going to modify the hash. And because the hash of this is part of what is like inside of these leaves that are included in the roots hash, then that would change the hash of everything all the way up. So this, this knowledge, what the hash would be of the root node, is just impossible to know up front, um, unless you have a, a hash function that's been broken. So if you don't use shell one, um, <laughs> bad things can happen. Uh, so any questions before we get into sort of block sizes and a discussion about, about that a little bit? No questions? Cool. OK, block sizes. So uh, yeah, block sizes are, are like the, the three bears. You know, you like uh, <laughs> too hot, too cold, just right. Uh, so blocks can be too big. Um, and there's some, when you start to make blocks bigger and bigger, you get a set of different problems. One big one is that you can't download a single block from multiple peers. Um, the problem is that uh, in, in an untrusted network, anybody could just give you bad data. The only way that you have to validate if the data was right or not is the hash of the entire block. So if you pull data from two people for the same block, and then it doesn't validate who sent you bad data. You have no idea. <laughs> um, so like BitTorrent has been dealing with this for like longer than anybody, and they just don't try to do that <laughs> anymore. If a, if a peer is too slow and they decide to take it from a new peer, they'll just download all the same data again. Um, you, so when, when you have these uh, large immutable structures and then you mutate them, you, you get a new root, which we'll, we'll get into in a little bit. Um, 
you end up creating what are called orphan blocks. Um, if you've ever built databases or dealt with any like on disk um, mutable data structures, you, you deal with the same problem where like as you change things, you end up with data that's just like garbage that then has to get collected um, at some point in time. So when you have really big blocks, that leaves you with really big orphan blocks, and then those really big orphan blocks create like a bigger GC problem. Um, Different transports may have different limitations. BitSwap has issues with blocks over two megabytes right now. That will probably be fixed, but like, you should still try to keep that in mind and keep in mind that other transports are gonna have similar issues. Um, you also end up with a lot less deduplication the bigger that you make the blocks. Um, that's because the, the only method that we have for deduplication is the hash itself. So um, if you take all of these, these little particles that would be the same data across many different nodes, but they're not links, they're just embedded in the blocks, then those won't ever get deduplicated. Um, too small. So you, you also end up with issues when you make a bunch of tiny, tiny, tiny blocks. So um, you, the big one is that you just end up with more requests for more blocks. If you want to get like a small amount of data, you end up getting like a lot of different blocks. Um, that could be out of the network, that could be off of disk, but it's always going to incur some kind of round trip, usually to I.O., unless you have like a lot of in-memory cache data. Um, you also end up with uh, more encoding time. Uh, when you write different block encoders, you can make them more efficient the more data that you have to encode at a time, usually. Uh, so if you, if you have a much smaller sets of data, then you may end up with less efficient encoding times. The big one, though, is hashing. It, hashes, hashing functions have uh, usually have guarantees about how long they're going to take for any amount of data. So if you end up with a lot of smaller blocks, you're going to end up with like many more hashes, which is actually going to spend like a lot more compute time on all that hashing. Um, and then so similar to the block request, you end up with just more hops to a given piece of data. So whenever you want to look at something through a deep graph, you end up like going from one thing to the next. Um, and the more that you, that you create, the more links in that chain that you create, the more perform potential performance impact you have. So what's just right? It, just right, like very much depends on your use case. There just isn't one true way to do this, unfortunately. Um, this is why we've created so many flexible structures and how you create blocks and how you create your DAGs, is that different use cases are going to call for very different DAG structures. So if you want to optimize for reads versus writes, if you can take a lot of uh, performance cost up front at write time to make the reads really fast, you might do that. Um, if you if you have a, so often when you have mutable structures, you will not actually mutate a particular um, part of the graph, but you might just recreate it every time. Um, a good example of this is like when IPFS creates a file and chunks it up. Um, we always pull that whole file out of disk and then run it through the chunker. We don't like look at the existing chunked file and go like, oh, I see like a particle that I can just stick in here, <laughs> right? Like, we, you know, in order to figure out if they match, we just re-encode it every time. And so you would use a very different algorithm to create that DAG and, 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 ba and balance it essentially. Um, than you would if you were just trying to mutate a DAG over time, right? Um, HAMP is like a really good example of like something that you mutate in place really often, and so there is a, there's an algorithm in the HAMP that guarantees a certain um, balance and a, and, a, and a fixed width, or sorry, a fixed depth of how big that tree will get. Um, so these are just like, you know, different trade-offs that you can make when you're deciding how to create the, the DAG and how much, and how big you want to create the block. You also have transport performance issues, right? Um, if you're pulling all of your blocks, uh, you know, out of like an HTTP2 connection to one host, it's going to have a very different performance profile than pulling them out of a peer, peer network. And so you might be able to make completely different trade-offs um, when, you're, when you're creating those block structures than you would otherwise. Um, so that's, oh wait, any questions before we break, actually? Can you go back one slide? Yeah. Cool. <laughs> In the back. So, um, Basically, right now for arbitrary data, there's no optimization to try and figure out if there's overlap. Like if you're just mutating a little bit of a file, mm -hmm. that most of the, the blocks will be the same out of what you chunk, right? But uh, if you change something that's arbitrary, how do you figure out what that arbitrary bit is? Can we leave the rest? You know? Yeah. So it turns out that that particular problem in the file case is dependent on the file type. Um, and there are different chunkers that you use to potentially get better deduplication out of different file types. And so we will actually get into that a little bit later. Um, do we, do, I think we talk about Raven a bit, right? Yeah, yeah. yeah. So like if you have text, uh, Raven is like an algorithm that breaks it up in a really nice way to, to do the deduplication. Next section. Yeah, yeah, that'll be in the next section. section. We promise. <laughs> yeah. Uh, any other questions about DAGs and block sizes?
Yes. Do, do you believe that the current algorithm is very efficient, or is there still a lot of work that's going on? Which algorithm? The, like the, <laughs> the produ production of the DAG for anything that's put into ad, for example. Um, I think that we, we have some good options. So the problem right now is that we, we are not pre-configured for different data types to use different chunkers. You have to tell it which chunker. I think that we have some really good options in which chunkers to use and pretty decent defaults in the chunker. I think that the, the thing that we're not very efficient at right now in UCSD1 is um, the, the DAG that leads up to the file. So the, the directory in the file, right? So like if you have a really tiny file, we don't have a way to like just inline that binary into the file and then if that file is really tiny, inline it into a directory, right? Like if you had a directory of five files and the entire set was like you know, maybe like one tenth of a megabyte, just one block. Like who cares? Um, but we don't actually have a way to do that in DAGPB right now. So um, at, in the initial SV2 deep dive uh, later today, I'll get into sort of how we might solve some of the problems. So I think that we, we don't have a very efficient way to create <coughs> the DAG leading into a file, but once we get into file chunking, we, we've done some pretty good work there. Sure. Are there some plans, sorry. Uh, are there some plans to have an inference sort of for associating file type or Depending yes. On file data yes. Yes. But in users, v two. Yes. Uh -huh. So a block is like a blob of data, which could be more than one file, one or more files, or is it going to just have be one file? Like if I have a text file. That's mm -hmm. So right. If I have like ten files in my repo. Mm -hmm. That's many blocks right now. Um, so r right now in UCSV1, that's going to be one block for the, the, the for sort of file metadata, and then at least one block for the actual file data that, that it's linking to. Um, and then the directory around it would be another block that links to those. So a block wouldn't contain more than one file? So they will in the future. I, I think that like, if you're just thinking about DAG sort of generically, um, the, the way that we've done things sort of in, in throughout the stack is that um, a block can contain an arbitrary number of what we call nodes, right? So a node is like any map or any value within it. We don't have, um, in, in newer codecs like DAG Seabor and DAG JSON, we don't have any sort of limitations on um, yeah, how deep you can go in that and what types that you can use. So um, in the future, I would say like, yes, one block could contain many files, um, but r right now there are some bigger restrictions on that. Um, yeah, there is, uh, yeah. To answer your question, there, you should not think of a one-to-one -one mapping between a file and a block, or really any data structure and a block. Um. Yep.